here is um, MPS. Is the font big enough for the people in the back? Okay. So um, here is an example program I wrote in a language called kernel f. It's, a, if you will, a full-blown functional programming language implemented in MPS. Uh, we use it, I think I mentioned this before, as the basis for domain-specific extensions. Um, because it's built in MPS, we can use um, MPS as language extension facilities to extend the language, restrict the language, to add new stuff, remove stuff, embed it in other stuff, and so on. Um, and I will, as part of this demo, I'll build a little language extension for kernel f. Um, it's I more interesting to build a little extension than to build a new language from scratch because here we have more context to play with, right? Uh, but the mechanics are, of course, identical. I mean, if you, uh, if you build a new language, then you extend the empty language, right? Um, so I've defined a function, x is greater than y. It takes two arguments, a number between 5 and 10, ten and, another another and another number. And it uses the if, I know it's a stupid contrived example, right? But it's hello world stuff. It checks if x is actually bigger than y. And if so, it returns yo. And otherwise, it returns neu. Um, uh, and um, here are a couple of test cases. Uh, what's interesting is that this first test case already has a type system error, right? Because 12 can statically be checked to not fit that range. That was not the point of the demo, but I thought I'd mention that. Uh, cool stuff. Um, the other two um, test cases work as expected. You can run these test cases right in MPS. I can uh, select the whole test case or a single assertion, press control, shift, alt, enter, whatever it is. I, I know how it works with my hands, but I can't tell you um, to execute these test cases. You can even uh, investigate the execution of the test case with this explorer I mentioned before. You can overlay the intermediate values. So all this infrastructure is already there. Okay. Um, so what we want to do now as part of the language development example is we're going to build essentially the same thing like the if then else when done sonst we use the german keywords we build the same thing again it's a useful hello world i could make up something stupid but why not use that okay so we're going to um, um, delete this thing um, return nix for now and then of course all these test cases fail i'm going to delete the first one because it was only there to demonstrate the type system check um, and so we're in a, in a good state. It tells me it returns nix, nothing. Um, and of course, they both fail. So now, if I were to build a real language extension in the sense that I'm you know, building a DSL and I want to extend kernel f, I would build a new language module. I would, you know, the kernel f language itself consists of um, whatever number this is, 10 languages. So you can, for example, use only the basic expressions without collections, or you can use the language without its own built-in simple types. So these are all language modules, and you can reuse them separately. And if I were to build an extension for a real use case, I would create a new module like com.mycustomer.whatever extension. Um, I don't do that now because it's you know it's just a bunch of new thing menu stuff. It's not interesting from a language engineering perspective. So I'm gonna invasively add the when done thing to the base to the core language. Again, it's not recommended, but it's good enough for, for the tutorial. And I made sure I can uh, unroll uh, roll back all the changes in Git later. So I'm going to create a new language concept. Language concept is the abstract syntax of the thing we're going to build. So uh, that's essentially, so other tools call these things meta classes or whatever. In MPS, these are called concepts, right? So and we're going to create a when, learn a bit of German today, uh, when expression, right? Um, if expression. And um, of course, the point is that we want to be able to use this when in all the places where an expe expression is expected. And in an ex functional language, that's essentially everywhere, right? Um, so there is normal polymorphism like an object oriented programming, but for language concepts. So if I want to be able to use a when expression in all the places where my existing kernel f language expects an expression, what do I have to do? Extend, derive, inherit, exactly. So right here, 
I'm just going to write expression. And if I had put this into a separate language module, then this would be the point when I would say my new module has a dependency on this base expression language because otherwise I wouldn't see expression, right? Right now I do see it because I've done it in the same place. So when expression extends expression, now how does this if then else thing look from a structural perspective in terms of the syntax tree? Any ideas? What children does it have? Hmm? And what is that? Exactly. And what else does it have? And, and what are those? Expressions. It's a functional language, there are no statements, so these are just more expressions. So we have three children, right? Um, the, I don't know, condition, which is an expression, and it's exactly one. And there's a little uh, thing that I would call a bug, but JetBrains thinks it isn't. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we probably call it done for the German thing and the uh, sonst. Uh, right? So the thing has three children, con well, uh, whatever, condition, done, and sonst, um, which are all expressions, right? So structurally, they're just expressions. So I can rebuild the language, command F9. Yes, actually, well, in my real if expression, kernel F supports uh, effect tracking. And if your if your then part has a modify effect, then you can avoid the else part, but only then. And we check that. So we do effect tracking for the functional phonetics here. So let's go to the example program here, go into my function, and again, if I had put that into a separate language module, I would first have to say that this program here, th th this model in which we have written this program, now uses this new language extension, right? This is this language modularity. I, I, I can use, I can import language modules like you import libraries or packages in Java or anywhere else, right? It's exactly the same thing. But we don't have to because it's in the language, we built it into a language that we already had. So in other words, we should be able to um, open the code completion menu and somehow find the when expression. Here it is, I can press enter and insert and nothing happens. Anybody, any idea why that could be? Uh, you, you can't know that if you don't know why it works, but still. Yeah, but why doesn't it show the MPS default editor? The, you know, the ugly one with... Yeah, it doesn't, why doesn't it do that? Because it inherits from an expression and expression actually defines this particular editor. So the abstract expression, which essentially is like nothing, defines this red error cell, right? So it inherits the editor from expression, which doesn't, which shows this thing, okay? Yeah, so we have to define an editor, a meaningful one. So we can do that, we can go to our, so the funny thing is, actually there is an instance of when expression. We created one. There is a node of type when expression in this program tree. It's just rendered in the same way as no expression. Weird, not good. But I can jump to the definition of when exp yes. Oh yeah, that's actually a very good idea. Yes, I can prove that. Uh, show reflective editor, here it is. Thank you, good idea. Right, there's our when expression with the three children. Does undo undo that? No. Uh, what F5? Okay, even works on the stupid touch bar. Okay, so <laughs> somebody had another? D no, no, no. There's no reason to ever define not an editor. I just didn't do it because I wanted to do it step by step. There's absolutely no e reason ever to not define one. All right, so let's define one. So I'm going to create an editor for our when done thing. Um, and editors are defined through cells, right? Cells are, if you will, the atomic unit of um, an editor definition. And right now there is nothing. So I can uh, make this the editor of when expression. I compile it. And um, 
Well, the disadvantage of doing that in the base language is that compilation takes long because it already cons contains all this other crap. Okay, next time different. Next time you ask a question while it's compiling, okay? Um, so now it looks like this. Notice how the existing program changed how it looked. Right? Because it's a projectional editor, I can always change the notation of existing elements and my program changes how it looks. Might be a bug, might be a feature, but that's how it is. So, going back here, I'm going to package this into a horizontal collection, press enter, and embed the condition here. So this percent thing in notation just means embed the editor of whatever the condition that you have there brings here. Like if that's, for example, if the condition is 5 greater than 3, then your top level ro ro uh, node is the greater thing, and then it brings an editor that puts left, greater, right, and then it projects that here. So it just embeds that particular child node. Um, so, yeah, and then the rest is probably obvious. Uh, done. Done. Sonst. Sonst. Okay. So, compile. Question, exactly. Yeah, it's actually a rather big language, so that's why it takes a little while. So now it looks like that. And I can, for example, write 4 plus 3, or I can already reference the x, right? Because this is just a argument ref expression, which is scoped to only see the referent or the expressions in the current function. And, th there you know, I can use everything that is already possible in terms of expressions in that place. Then... 12 else uh, 20. 20. Is this a correct program? Hmm? Yes, exactly. So, th this is important to understand. Structurally, this program is correct, right? Because we said. Here, we expect an expression, and we can write whatever expression we want. We didn't express that the type of that expression must be Boolean. Okay? So we need to do that. So for that purpose, MPS comes with a type system definition DSL. Um, because I, I didn't say that, but um, yeah. That's not dynamic. That's just the inference rule that says that um, uh, uh, there is a type coercion that if you expect Boolean and you have uh, a number that is actually zero, that it's then uh, type Boolean, and the interpreter uh, casts that to, to, to false. Yeah, you can do that. What you can, of course, also do is not at all implement any type system and do runtime type checking. But that's not a typical use case for MPS. You have, I would say, all DSLs I've, well, Alex just talked about before that one of the examples he built doesn't, but most DSLs have static type checking because MPS supports it, and it's not a good I, it's not a good fit to build DSLs for domain experts with good error messages, but then don't do type checking. It kind of doesn't fit very well, right? Okay, so let's go back to our when done thing and create a type system inference rule. I always make this short so it's easier to write. Um, so, what would we say? Well, the type of the condition of the when expression, and I'm just going to write something, um, and you're going to then. So, two things. One, you can read this simply as Boolean. The fact that there is this type factory thing is because I mentioned before. Uh, kernel F supports replacement of primitive types. You can supply your own set of primitive types. And the way how you replace them even inside type system rules is that the type system rules all create their types through a factory. And then there is an extension point like an Eclipse where you can contribu contribute another factory. And that's how you replace your primitive types. So you can read this as simply new instance of Boolean type. Okay? That's all. You don't, don't care about this. That here is more interesting. This is not an assignment. This is 
um, what you see here is an equation, literally, one that can be solved in both directions, right? This is a constant because you're creating a new object of Boolean type. This is a variable. It's the variable that represents the type of the condition of the Venn expression. So what this essentially says is, here is a free variable, here is a constant. This says the two must be the same. So what does this tell us? The only way to make this rule correct is to assign, like the type system engine assigns Boolean to this. So this essentially specifies that your condition must be Boolean. The reason why this is cool is because it works in both directions, you get type inference for free. Not in this case, because there is a constant. You can't infer and change the value of a constant. But in general, if you say things like um, that some two types must be the same or stuff like that, then you get, it can be solved in both directions, you get inference for free. Very cool. Not so easy to debug if it goes wrong. Sometimes there is a type system debugger, and uh, I know somebody who says he knows somebody at JetBrains how to use this debugger. Uh, Alex is the person who knows the other person. Uh, I mean, I'm joking a little bit, but it's not so easy to understand. I mean, it's solver-based. There's a lot of magic going on, and debugging magic is hard if you don't understand the magic. General problem. Okay, so let's see if this works. Oops. Press F5 once to re-trigger the type system, and it says that there is a problem, as we would expect it. If I change this to a greater, the error goes away. Okay? Now what's this? That's a strange error message. And indeed, it's a strange error message. The error message should say, I don't have a type for the whole when expression. Because there is a typing rule somewhere else that says that the type of that function is inferred to be the type of the expression in the body of the function, right? So it the type system engine tries to compute the type of the when thing, but we didn't specify the type of the whole when thing. We only said that that must be a boolean, but we didn't say about anything about the any about the others. Okay, um, and so we can. Uh, do this a little bit differently because kernel f supports also, of course, explicit type. You can say that this must be a Boolean, uh, and now the error message is still the same because now it tries to make it Boolean. So this doesn't help. So really what we have to do is we have to uh, provide a type typing rule for this. And so here is where it becomes actually quite interesting because that's why this is an interesting example. Um, so what actually is the, uh, in general, what is the, type of this thing? Huh? Yes? The exactly. The type of this whole thing is the super type of these two. Because it can either return this or that. So if you had a type system that would not track n ranges in numbers, right? If you forget about this for a second. Then you would simply say, well, if these are both numbers, then the return type is number. If you would say, you know, if you would put some string here and a number here, you would get an error because the type system cannot compute a super type between a string and a number. There is no Java lang object super thing of everything. So, um, but here, what would we do here? I, I tell you how this works in, in, in general, and then I tell you how it works in that specific case because of these stupid ranges. Makes it a bit more complicated. Actually, I'm probably not going to explain that part. Um, so, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a type system variable. I'm going to call that t. I'm going to express that the type of the when uh, done part, of the then part of the if, is must be the same or a super type of t. Okay? Same thing for the sonst part. Okay, so I express, I just express constraints on that free variable I've created. I've said, whatever the type of t is, this must be actually a subtype, right? I did it the wrong way, right? So the t must be the super type. So this, these must, must both be subtypes, and this symbol means that that guy is bigger. So I put the wrong arrow. Um, why didn't anybody tell me? Alex. <laughs> Okay, whatever. T that's a very typical mistake. You'll notice with the first test. 
And then you say that the type of the whole thing is T. Oh, I probably, no, whatever. Okay? So this is, once you understand how this constraint solving thing works, this is rather obvious. Um, so let's see what happens. Actually, I have no clue what happens because of these ranges. Let's see. Okay. Let's ask MPS what the type of this is. Aha! It. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to see this. Let's do a different example. Actually, it should. Re by the way, it should return a string anyway, right? We expect strings. So. Yo. No. And now it's better because now it's string, because it's the same types. The, the thing is with these ranges, um, to make these calculations correct, you have to essentially call a utility function that we've implemented as part of kernel f. There is a compute common supertype range, and it does that. I don't want to bother you with this. So this is fundamentally how you do it, the way I showed it, wherever it's gone. This is how you do it. And now our um, if-then-else thing has a type. So now from a like from a structural perspective, the program is finished, or the language is finished. Of course, if you look very closely, what's missing is that the keywords here, right? We need to make them to use the keyword style so that the colors match. Of course, this is a irrelevant detail, but I just want to show you that you can, you know, uh, set styles, you can set font size, bold, whatever, the usual styling thing. You can make all of these dynamic, you know, if the value is bigger than 5, then make the thing red, whatever. Actually, not based on the value, because you'd need the interpreter there, but, okay. Question? <laughs> all right, now it's blue. Okay, so, so far so good. What happens if I run this? I get a no result because we never wrote an interpreter for this. There is no semantic definition what this actually means. Okay, so we've done everything except made it run, and this is where you uh, either have to provide a generator or an interpreter. Since kernel f is, I is well, we are almost done with the Java generator, but by default it's interpreted. So we have to enhance the existing interpreter to be able to handle this. Okay, so I'm going to grab the existing interpreter definition and this is another DSL for specifying interpreters and the way you do this is simply to put the when expression here and then you write Java code that runs it. So this is pretty simple. So how do you evaluate the when expression? What do you do? Huh? Say again, I didn't hear it. Yes? True? So there will be there will be an if that checks for true, a Java if at some point. Yes. But what do we have to do first? Huh? And which one? Yeah, particularly the condition, because then otherwise we can't make any decision here, right? And then the question is, do we actually evaluate both or only the one that's activated, but whatever. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to recursively call the interpreter for the condition child, okay? And the recursive uh, interpreter call is just done like this. So we've invented this hash syntax, which is shortcut for in re recall the whole interpreter infrastructure with all its extensions and language modularity stuff for the cond child of the current node. And the reason why we've come up with this uh, ugly but very concise syntax is because you do that all over the place. Uh, functional interpreters are essentially recursive calls of interpreters, and the shorter you can make this, the less convoluted this whole stuff gets. So that's a good trade-off, even if it's initially maybe uh, strange. So I'm going to run this. I'm going to run this recursively and assign this to uh, a variable. 
uh, what I'm going to do is, and then I'm going to check if condition value um, is an instance of Boolean. Here I know that in kernel F, um, the Java Boolean is used in interpreters to represent values of DSL level type Boolean. Right? Not so surprising. Um, for numbers, you know, there's numbers with ranges and stuff, we use Java's big integer here. So you have to know that. That's a part of a decision of your language design or implementation. And I know that, telling you this must be a Boolean. So technically speaking, I don't even have to make this check because the type system already proves or checks that. So, but of course, I can run programs even if they have an error in the type system. So I am defensive here. Okay. So I'm checking if it's actually a Boolean. If it's not a Boolean, I just return some crap because um, there's no reason to return anything sensible if the type checking of the program doesn't even succeed. Um, so I'm just returning null, and when you and the, inter in the, the interpreter will just say constraint, failure, exception, strange. Okay? I, I could return a meaningful error message here that is then kind of shown, but I'm not going to do that. So, okay, it's a Boolean. I can now say the conval, uh, I can cast this to Boolean and assign that to another variable. And I can then say if b else. So now we're at this place where here we return what? Huh? Exactly. Yeah, so we return the recursive call of the done part, right? And same here with else. Uh, shit, sonched. Okay? So it's it also has the semantics that um, it doesn't evaluate the those the, 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 that child which is not activated. Um, this is important if these things have effects, right? Right now, if they don't have effects, it doesn't matter. You can evaluate anything as many times as you want. If it doesn't have an effect, it just heats up the CPU. Doesn't matter. Um, but if this thing has ex uh, has effects, then this semantics is important. Like if I if I pulled these things up and evaluated both before I made the decision. That would be, technically speaking, a possible implementation of that language, but probably a very unexpected one. So this is how you would do it. All right. So I think that's it. Build. OK, so this works. 9 is bigger than 7. Oh, I, I didn't even do put the y here, right? So put it like this. Works. Done. Questions? Uh, you can, for example, return a constrained violated exception and put a string in there, and that's then shown in the test. Um, or you can define your own exception that inherits from inter interpreter escape exception or something, and then do whatever you want. Um, so, I mean, the general thing is that um, if your program doesn't chi type check, don't run it. Not a good idea. But yeah, but there is no technical means to prevent that because then the running thing would have to check everything and, you know, that's just expensive. Right, so there are a few more things. For example, you can define intentions. Uh, I can just briefly create a sensible one, the intention to replace with the real if. Replace with real if. And so an intention is simply in Eclipse, it's called a quick fix, right? I guess you're all IntelliJ users, so you know what intention is. It's the, 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 the little light bulb thing. Um, and I can, for example, create a new uh, actual if expression, right? Actually, I can make this a little bit nicer or, well, different. I can use uh, literals. So this is now an object of if expression whose condition is the inputs um, the inputs condition copied for now and we have two more of these which is the then part and the else part is the done part is the sonch part and 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the node we're talking about and replacing it with what I just created. So this takes the when thing on which we call it and replaces it with an actual if expression which has the three values we, you know, the, the same condition, same then, same else part. I, yeah, it doesn't get much more concise, right? This is actually quite cool. So um, run this. Alt enter, replace with real if, looks like that. Oh yeah, I made a mistake. The else part is actually a else uh, whatever if I forget how this works. Uh, huh? Ah yeah yeah right mistake. The else part is deprecated. I have to create an else section which then has the expression. That had to do with the ability to get rid of the whole else thing if you have an effect. So I did a refactoring at some point. And uh, so let's undo this, right? We're back to where we were and do the replace with real if and now it works. Um, so you can also see, that's maybe interesting, the like turnaround time. Um, it's really quick. Um, you can really do very much, I mean, this is test-driven language development, literally. And you can really iterate very quickly. And if you know what you're doing, you're extremely productive. And then you get stuck, then you need help. But um, you know people now, right, um, who can help. Yeah, question. Yeah, for example, um, this test case here, or the function, right? The function has, uh, of course, a bunch of arguments and a body. But it also has a name. And the name isn't a node, it's a property, it's a string node. So function uh, inherits from I function like, which inherits from I valid named concept, which inherits from I named concept, and that has a name property that represents the actual name. More questions? Yes? That one here, that's kernel F. No. Um, there is space language, the Java of JetBrains, which you can extend in exactly the same way as I just extended the kernel F. Yeah, there is XML. You can download embedder. Then you have C. You can download kernel F. It's open source. You can extend that, right? So there's all kinds of stuff available. And actually, I mean, um, the question of whether you should start from scratch or extend an existing language, there's a whole story about language design trade-offs which we don't have time to cover. Um, but th so th this is another nice thing. Once you master MPS, it is a tool that really gets out of the way and you can really think about language design, like not what mechanically do I have to do to get this crap to work. It will work and you just can think about what is the best way to express this, what is the best way my users will understand this, how do I actually design the language? And sure, then you have to build it, but that's then usually not a huge problem once you're over the learning thing. Yes? Yeah. 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 Well, one way is you just go to uh, the editor. Let's go back to our when done thing, right? So. You selected an example that's like a bit of a cheat, right? Now it's reverse order, right? Th th because I didn't actually change anything in the structure. The, the existing programs are still valid. It's just now projected the other way around. So this is interesting because um, whenever you make a change that only affects the concrete syntax, you don't have to do any migrations. There is nothing to do. By the way, that's exactly the opposite from a parser-based system because there, if you change the concrete syntax, you have to modify the programs. However, in the parser-based stuff, you don't have to change the programs if you modify the abstract syntax, which is here, right, the opposite. So this is exactly the, like, the opposite in both cases. So this works, and of course, it's semantically equivalent, okay? Um, 
but of course what you were really getting at it is if you make a, a change to the language what do you do with existing models and there are uh, three cases one is you make a change that leaves the old programs valid like we've added something to the language the existing programs didn't know about this so they didn't use this so I don't have to do anything it's just that the user now has more stuff available the other thing is you delete things like let's say the functions are no longer available then um, you can um, uh, supply so the way this works in MPS is MPS has a counter for language for the language a version counter and you can associate migration scripts with changes of these versions so in other words your user opens the model and a dialog pops up that says hey uh, whoever has deployed a new language into your MPS a new sorry a new language version you now have to run migrations you press yes and it migrates your models it runs the scripts that you provide as part of your language evolution it doesn't come up with these scripts automatically you have to write them which is usually not a big deal but the point is that it has the infrastructure to automatically find the change and run them automatically and then there's the third case where you can't write a script because there is no semantically unique way of doing this in that case you leave the old construct in there you deprecate it and you associate an error message with it right I can do that I can go let's say we want our users to no longer use the crappy old if expression but to use the strange syntax wrong way when thing so I can go to an if expression and I can uh, deprecate it or I can simply go to my uh, type system and write a checking rule uh, there's already one so I just give it a different name for the if expression and I just say error uh, nah. no longer supported please use uh, whatever uh, then right and you associate that with the if expression and now all instances of the if expression will show that error and of course you can also associate uh, an intention with this and then you know you can just say alt enter okay do it right and if it's not semantically unique you say you know either do this or do that and you provide quick fixes for both and the user makes the selection themselves so there's no problem in fact this is another one of these pet peeves um, people always say well if you lose languages you have to evolve models and stuff how do you do that if you work with APIs and you change your API there's no migrations you can't even customize the error message it's just a compiler that says I don't find this method anymore or argument missing there is no version counter there's nothing so this is actually easier right so if I run the if thing then I directly get the error no longer supported please press undo okay more questions All right, so quick summary. Um, it is true that MPS is a bit of a learning curve. MPS does many things differently than other tools. Um, and if you have a, let's say, hello world level DSL problem in your organization, it's not a good choice, right? Then use Xtext, hack something together, um, fine. But for problems that are a little bit more sophisticated when you want to use DSLs as the backbone for something important, when you expect that the languages become more complex or you might even have several languages or you need this language modularity then this is the way to go then it's worth going over the kind of language learning hump and it really pays off um, I don't have a flip chart but there is this um, this case where if you put the language complexity of the X axis and the effort to build your language on the Y axis then X text is like that right it's very simple to build something simple but then as things things get more sophisticated it really becomes tough really I mean yeah uh, well I mean it's always possible but it becomes really complex yeah and in MPS is different the curve is like this right for the simple thing you have to learn relatively new relatively many new things and it's that's sometimes hard to justify but then once you've learned it it really scales well with complexity of what you need to do because of the modularity because of the different syntax forms tables and stuff this is the trade-off so if you if you have a serious problem MPS is the better choice for the simple stuff MPS is maybe not the perfect per per perfect argument of course the problem is everything always starts simple right people use X text and then you're already down the wrong path and you're screwed so uh, maybe the recommendation is always use MPS you never know what's coming <laughs> <laughs> all right I think that's it <laughs>